Okay, well, I'll just I'll just say welcome to you, Andrew Edkins. Thank you very much. Of, of UCL, um, we've spoken quite a bit about uh, your uh, interest in um, space exploration and space colonization at Mars, and we had hoped to have you with us uh, at the March EVA uh, conference, uh, but unfortunately, um, you couldn't make it, and. Um, we because we put you on back to back with Baz from Airbus, who who who'd taken part in the uh, was it the Orion mission up to the moon, um, and and their contribution. And he had a very neat segue into what you were going to talk about. So here's the neat segue, um, Andrew. You're interested in in the exploration, and I think you're seeking to have a um, some kind of research unit um, uh, founded, possibly within UCL or, or broader right. as well. So so yeah, yeah. go ahead and convince us. OK, so afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, today's a bit of a kind of wheels have come off. So um, but we'll we'll muddle on. Um, I have got what would have been pushing it to have delivered a presentation um, in the 40 minutes that Steve likes to deliver, because um, the genesis of the presentation that I will share with Steve at some point is 247 megabytes. So it's a pretty hefty one. It includes a little bit of animation in it. Um, but maybe, you know, if you want to share it, if you want to see it, I can, um, I'll do my best to, to, to somehow get it around. But the, the genesis of this presentation that you can't see, which I'm going to... Thank you. I'll, I'll get off. Thanks, Karen. Okay. okay. Bye. Bye. Um, is that um, I started something called the, the... I was asked to set up something called the Bartlett Real Estate Institute. And... So I work at UCL. I, I've been in the sort of area of projects and construction management for most of my academic for most of my career, with either as a practitioner or as an academic. And I moved into this into this area of real estate with the challenge of rethinking it. Um, put bluntly, you know, real estate is off is considered about the money side of things. So it's the economics, the finances, the contracts to do with property and and what you do with land permissions, and how I came to be presenting or discussing with you today um, about something as bizarre as off-world living and my campaign, um, which basically because of in academia, um, if I declare something to exist, it does. So I've created the Off-World Living Institute simply because I thought it would be a bit of a hoot. And the story behind why somebody with absolutely no background in anything to do with space engineering, space physics, astronomy or any of those sorts of things comes to, to to the point that I've got to is simply on the basis of conversations that I had um, that were my mindset was thinking rethinking real estate and the European Space Agency's director general or the then director general has changed since um, had this plan to to and this is where the Orion um, work comes in because there's a big a very very big move towards um, putting humans back into space with the, um, at the moment, the, the end game being to get humans to Mars. And it becomes pretty clear once you start looking at the engineering and logistic um, challenges that to do that, we're going to have to go back to the moon um, and use that either as, well, for, for both, you know, a, a, a stepping off point and also to kind of get ourselves familiar with humans back in space, but now in the 21st century rather than the 20th century, so back on the moon, as it were. So the Director General in getting the European Space Agency folk to think about this coined the phrase moon village. And a guy that I know, a bloke I work very closely with, who works very closely with these, so mentioned this in passing. And I went, oh, a village. OK, well, I'm rethinking real estate and suddenly thinking about creating a village on the moon. And that immediately sparked a whole load of questions that come from not the technical and engineering side, but very much more sort of the social sciences side of things. So I ha we had discussions and it led very rapidly to this consideration, which is and the slide deck, which I'm not going to talk, try and describe to you um, without you seeing it. But basically, we go from this huge romantic um, and long, long history of being fascinated by the stars. So one of the images that I've got is one of the geoglyphs, which are these massive um, drawings that have been um, made by 
civilizations now long gone um, in the South Peruvian, in the in the Nazca Desert, and you, you'll recognise them when you see them. You know, they're sort of like the the um, chalk um, down drawings that we see in this country, but these ones are on a huge scale, and they were designed, you know, with 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 quite astonishing abilities that kind of defy modern man to think how did ancient uh, ancient ancestors managed to create these hummingbirds and bumblebees and butterflies and whatever these images that are sort of hundreds and hundreds of meters in length and can only really be made out when you're you know a god um uh, so you need to be in a plane or certainly above the ground um which they couldn't have done at the time so how we on a, how on earth they had the the ability but they, they but they had the passion they were these were these these are supposedly you know signs uh, uh, recognizing um god then we move to the science fiction world hg wells war of worlds there's an image on that but basically the 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 argument about off-world living is because we are fundamentally explorers and because we have been and are and will continue to be captivated by what's up there above us in space. So from a history of, of exploration around the world, high mountains, you know, Felix Baumgartner, who's now holds the record for the um, you know, highest ever um, freefall, where he goes up in a helium balloon to the very edge of space and then jumps back out of it. Um, and we're also starting to demonstrate our ability to last. So some statistics for you. Mark van der Heij uh, is the holds the US astronaut record for longest serving continuous stay in space by a US astronaut at 355 days. And Valerie Polakoff, who's Russian, um, holds the world record at 300, uh, sorry, at 437 days, which is 14 months continuously occupying in the US case, it's the International Space Station. In the uh, Russian case, it's the Mir Space Station. Then we move on to the why now. Um, and the, 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 the arguments are that basically all of the sort of stars, to, to coin a phrase and, and be a pun, um, have, have aligned. The, after 50 plus years of humans being on the moon, um, and with all of the era of the space shuttle and all of the forerunners to the ISS, um, we've now really conquered um, low Earth orbit. Um, but we've never ventured back uh, to put humans in onto another uh, extraterrestrial body. And there's basically there's the money, there's the political um, leadership. Um, and, and critically, this is now coming from more than one place. So we're not in a Cold War situation. We're now seeing um, both states. So you've still got the big players now joined by um, China um, who have you know, rapidly developed. But there are smaller nations, Israel, India, others are, 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 are really now able to sort of get, the, get to grips with this. Um, but also the private sector, and we all know, you know, Elon Musk with SpaceX and Jeff, Be Jeff Bezos with um, uh, Blue Origin and our very own um, Richard Branson with, with the Virgin, both the orbit and the, and the galactic. So, you know, the touristy side and the satellite and instrument placement side. So we've now got an interesting matrix. We've got east, west and private and public ac actors deeply engaged with plans and the money to back those plans to, to put humans both back onto the moon and then ideally and hopefully um, onto to Mars. And there's a slide that you can get, it's freely available from NASA that shows the stages, which includes uh, um, the Orion um, projects to the, to the moon, but also the involvement of organizations like Boeing and um, Airbus and Lockheed Martin and all of these others that, that will be providing elements. Um, so there's plenty of private sector engagement with the uh, program, to, to use the phraseology that, that we would be familiar with. That's a series of individual projects. Some of them um, are, are logistical and some of them are also reconnaissance. And, and frankly, that's where at the stage we're at at the moment. So we're preparing the ground and we're doing it now at pace. So, you know, imagine slides showing you the, you know, the, the SpaceX Starship, which is the big um, 
uh, people carrier that is also capable of, of vertical relanding. I mean, quite astonishing. I mean, you know, some kid that was born in the mid 60s, as I was, and grew up watching Thunderbirds. You know, this isn't far short of what I imagined the future would be like to watch, you know, rockets landing back on the pad that they took up off from after watching years and years of, you know, parachute landings of little capsules into the sea or, or onto the desert in, um, in the uh, Russian plains. So we're getting there. Um, and the questions then become, so the challenges, um, and bearing in mind that I'm heading towards the point of saying that, 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 that I'm an academic at an ac academic institute where I'd like to create a, a, a sub institute that looks at um, the uh, off world living. So some challenges. I, I mean, I, I had to be prepared for this. I've been I've done some contentious things in the past. So one of the things that I have to do is recognize that every, uh, there will be challenge. You know, this is a this is a grotesque waste of money and resources at a time of dire need. And we should be focused on the climate emergency and um, inequality. And now, you know, the daily headlines with the cost of living crisis and all of this. And, and why have we got all of these players, both private and public sector, committing huge amounts of money? Because this none of what I'm talking about is cheap um, at such a time. And, and, and my answer to it is that this is freedom of choice. Um, you know, demograph uh, democratic processes elect the leaders of, of the US and the leaders of the countries that are very much out, some of them outside of Europe who contribute to the European Space Agency. So it includes Canada, um, for example, as well as us. And we are all nations that can decide if a polit politician and a political platform is created that says we don't want to support space research or putting humans back into space, then, you know, if we vote the, those politicians in, then that will become um, the policy. What we have got at the moment is a lot of interest um, driven by the private sector and their investors, um, as well uh, as the public through the um, government to actually put money into NASA uh, and ESA and in the East, you know, slightly different way of making decisions, but you've got money being channeled into both the Russian and the Chinese space agencies. So it's not, I mean, yes, that money can't be used more than once, but the argument is, um, and, and it's one that played out with NASA, um, is that with the Apollo series, no matter how much it costs, and many of you will well, no doubt I've, I've heard the stories that, you know, they, they simply didn't know how much it was going to cost. I mean, when, when um, uh, Kennedy basically wanted to make a big announcement to, to, to say that, you know, the US were going to put a, a man on the moon, quote unquote, um, but within the decade, there was no confidence at all about the budget. So the guy that provided it, um, basically, he, he, he knew the, num the best number and he added 35% to that without reference to anybody. He just simply went, here's the number, here's our best guess, I'm going to stick a 35% contingency on it, because frankly, if they don't know what the number was before, they'll just operate with the number I give them. And it came out not far short. I mean, if, if he'd have not added the 35% contingency, it would have been a heavily, heavily over, overrun um, cost budget for the, um, for, the, for the Apollo program. But as it was, it didn't do too badly. And since then, we've recognised that, you know, this this type of activity is really a it's not quick, b it takes some takes consistently deep pockets, um, and c it takes actually that determination to see it through. So the arguments are at the moment you've got a couple of kind of cavalier billionaires who just want to burn their money and and they're able to do so. But Elon Musk is easily able to raise more money if he needs it. He, the, you know the investor market believes in him. Um, and national governments and NASA uh, uh, in particular are, are being supported politically because the media and public sentiment isn't too against them. So we end up in a situation of, OK, that's great. Where are we? Well, it's really clear. It's very, very clear that we're in the machine age. And if you speak to enough and I've now I don't know if I've spoken to enough, but certainly the very, very clear image that I have got from talking to enough people who, who, have, who are very familiar with space type environments, space engineering is if they could, they'd keep humans out 
of this this situation putting a human into space or putting a human on the moon or putting a human on mars is massively more difficult than sticking machines up there and it would be so much easier if we didn't have to didn't, didn't want to go but unless we put humans up there there isn't the there isn't literally the human interest so the curiosity and perseverance rovers that are doing great stuff i mean this week you know in in pure coincidence because this was scheduled um, a while ago but you we some of you may have noticed that the you know in the mainstream news there's been um the 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 actual same question as the title of, that steve gave to this presentation which is um the you know is there life on mars and you've got good old perseverance trundling up to the edge of a crater that led to a delta of a lake that if there were microscopic organisms this the soil and the rock that the um uh, the the delta would have hold, held is going to be ripe but if you look then into the detail perseverance is going to collect the samples then another rover has got to arrive to take the samples to a place where a third mission is going to actually come collect it and ping it back because we can't do the analysis to determine is there life on mars without bringing these rock samples back to earth and whilst we've actually got the samples that are going to be collected anytime soon the next two missions to bring the samples back to a collection point and then collect them they are still work in progress and currently being looked at and being looked at positively um, by the, the various um, agencies so we're in a world now where we can do some really sophisticated things probably from a space technology and i mean i'm, I'm sure there are some people on the call but from what i've understood the the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope that is replacing Hubble, which is kind of getting to end of useful life, and is going to be a sort of step change in, in resolution and, uh, and, and optometry. Um, that was probably one of the most sophisticated automated sequence of processes and um, required intricate engineering and stage management to get this unfurling of of a machine that really you know it, it was a quart in a pint pot it was a massive piece of equipment that has to unfurl to multiple sizes of tennis courts and it all all has to do this seamlessly without anything going wrong i think that there were some i think nasa reported something like 273 mission critical single points of failure on the unfurling part and that ignores getting it up there in the first place so you know the the technological risk um that we are taking and overcoming i mean you know it, it went faultlessly um they're really pleased it's early days it's doing all of its calibration but we're now in a position where we can send these rovers and these instruments highly highly complicated very very sensitive to these massively hostile environments and they do the job you know they trundle around for for, for weeks months possibly even years and great brilliant builds confidence putting humans up there big step change big step change and that's just getting them up there my point is um and i'm going to kind of bring this in much quicker than i would have done so you know maybe not having the present slides is a is a positive is that where we get and, and i'm going to, you can't see this but i'm going to very quickly trundle through my own slides um to the point where if i so the reason for arguing about uh, an institute an academic institute to look at this was was the following um it's the range of issues that are thrown up when you start thinking about humans not just visiting i mean we've been day trippers to the moon right we go there we spend a, a couple of nights a couple of days come back you're not going to do that with mars the, the the simple logistics the simple distances and uh, uh and parameters that you have to consider alignment of of orbits um burn rate of fuel and all that means that we will not be going to mars as a day tripper so immediately we start thinking about longer term stays for humans on a body that is n that we were never um uh, created to to inhabit better than the moon the moon is utterly appalling for human life uh, i mean i couldn't i can't believe how dangerous the moon is for any length of time to stay 
um, because it's got no atmosphere, it's got no magnetosphere, so it doesn't deflect cosmic rays. Um, interesting stat that I came across was that if the first Apollo landing, the one that everybody remembers, um, if that had occurred, I think it was two weeks, it might be two weeks or two months, and there might be some space geeks who can correct me, but it was relatively short period of time after the actual landing, all three of the astronauts that landed on the moon would have died because there was a burst of cosmic radiation that was pretty immediately lethal. They would have been dead within, they probably wouldn't have made it back to Earth. They would have got such high radiation doses. So it was, and, and that wasn't predicted. That was pure luck that we happened to be on the surface at a relatively quiet time. So one of the issues that became um, the, well, actually, uh, I'll, I'll come to it in a second. But the first one is, is about what would it be like to be one of these people? Um, because at the moment, astronauts are a different class. They are extraordinarily talented beforehand. And then they go through this massive training scheme to make them different from you and me. They are not ordinary individuals who become astronauts. If we're going to be living off world, then we start to think about, well, actually, what are the human issues? So first and foremost, UCL has a really good anthropology department, and we are currently studying part of an international team of people studying life on the International Space Station. What, what, do, humans, what do humans become when they haven't got gravity? Um, so when they will float around and, I'll, and maybe during questions, I'll, I'll give you some anecdotes. Second thing, and this is a really interesting one. Again, it might be a pub quiz for those question for those of you interested, um, is that there's something called the Outer Space Treaty, which tries to consider humans um, in, in these type of extraterrestrial environments. Um, and it says that no extraterrestrial body. Um, so we, you can't point at the moon or Saturn or Titan or any of the other um, extraterrestrial bodies that we that we're aware of and suddenly claim it in the name of the United Kingdom or United States or Australia or wherever. But the Outer Space Treaty is silent on if you can get to a bit of that 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 body. So we land on Mars. There are two countries in the world that have actually said and they've written it into their laws that they can claim extraterrestrial territory as sovereign territory of that country. No guesses. I would normally make this a quiz, but I'll tell you now. The first one is the United States. So if US get up there, they will claim the bit of Mars that they land on as sovereign US territory. And the other one, bizarrely, is Luxembourg. Don't ask me why. Maybe someone can tell me, but I've always liked that as the you would guess one, but you probably don't get the other. So the rule of law, whose law would we be operating under is a non-trivial one because we're going to be needing to have rules. That's how we get um, security and, uh, and comfort. And then the last one, which is another interesting one, because there's a whole sort of industry 5.0 to, 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 to coin that, which is the space mining. So there are those organisations now that are looking to send, again, probably not humans, but they'll send machines up because they've recognised that on certain extraterrestrial bodies, there might be extremely valuable um, commodities that if the, the economics works out, you know, you can get up there, you can mine it and you can bring it back. It could be viable. So that's the first one. The second point is about the issues associated with us and what it does to our health. So our physiology and our psychology. Um, the other, th this connects then to um, one of the pieces of information that I learned was that we are much safer with um, uh, living underground, which we don't typically want to do in this on our planet. We don't, we aren't troglodytic. We do like to have the sun on our back and we know to know where, what time of day it is. But if we're going to go to any of these places, way safer to live in caves or in cracks or in fissures, or if you can't do that, then drill in and create your own caverns. Um, so that then means that when you see all of the science fiction romantic bases, they're always typically on the, on the surface. Well, they can be on the surface, but they've got to be completely overlaid with lots and lots of um, rock and soil to try and protect um, because we're so blessed in on this planet with, with the protections that our atmosphere um, and a magnetic core provide us. And finally, uh, well, on, on this point anyway, um, is that humans will not be able to survive without massive reliance and interrelationship with machines. 
So the development of artificial intelligence with machine learning and machine recovery should be something that we've really got to, to work on. Um, and then the last one is that in order to, to live on off world, uh, yeah, in order to live off world, you're, we're going to need to start creating new science. And this was the reason, so the, the three blocks that I've got are there's some fundamentals, anthropological, um, legal um, governance, so jurisprudence and all that good stuff. Then we've got some really quite human practical, how are we going to live up there? How are we going to send the robots and the machines up there to prepare the habitat so that on day one we've got somewhere to live because we won't be able to create our own habitats. And then the last one which drops out of all of that is the new technologies, the new scientific breakthroughs, the stuff that we haven't even thought about that we'll need to tackle, that will eventually need to be dealt with. And and the great thing is that I've, talk, I've spoken to enough, again, and the same, same sort of people that I've learned a, such a lot from. And the best guess is that for human off-world living, and by that we mean capable of staying up in, in these places like Mars for any, a reasonably indefinite period of time, bearing in mind that we can't stay in low Earth orbit for more than 14 months, bearing in mind that it's really difficult to maintain a constant human presence even in the Antarctic. So you have a summer crew that does all the science and then a winter crew that basically boils down because it's so difficult to get there. And, we're, and that's on our own planet where we've got oxygen and, and gravity. And uh, um, So in order to actually make all of these things that I've just described work, the best guess that we're getting is no one believes it's going to be less than 80 years from now. And that's a really optimistic. Most people saying it's 100 to 120 years away before we get to that point. So between now and you know this time next century, um, we have got an enormous amount of challenge to a real rich diversity. And the thing that excites me most and kind of, you know, it's, it's the thing that I love is that it brings up so many interesting opportunities for collaboration between different knowledge areas, between different sectors, between different types of player. And it, along that journey, as we know from the development of, you know, everything from ballpoint pens and Teflon to cling film and Kevlar, um, you know, investment in scientific and technological research into aerospace often yields benefits um, that that we can utilize here on earth steve i'm going to stop there because um i think that the last part of the of the presentation was uh, some examples <laughs> which i can't show you i mean they're, they're basically images of pieces of work that my colleagues at ucl are working on that are you know from the wild and wacky to the really hadn't thought that you'd need that, but it would be handy if we could get one. Um, but I'm going to, because of I'm very conscious of, of the fact that, you know, I know we started late and, and there's a few gremlins in the system, but I do fancy giving opportunity for some other yeah. people to, to speak other than me. So thank you. Yeah. Well, um, unsurprisingly, we'll start with A and go with Mr. Bob Arnold, who's got a question for you. Yeah, no, it's interesting stuff, Andrew. Um, just, um, uh, well, a couple of questions, really. Um, I... You talk quite confidently about there's no life on Mars other than maybe at kind of micro level sort of thing. Yep. But just on the off chance, you did find a little green man up there with a pointy head and all the rest of it. What um, what would your, as an estate agent, which is <laughs> your, what you're really talking about, wasn't it? Yeah. Real estate, I think, is why going yep. up. Yeah, yeah. What would your approach be, to wipe them out or to offer them presents? No, oh, no, no. I mean, the, the well... I mean, the first thing is, if I think if we, I mean, <laughs> okay, so to to take this to, um, if they were if they were literally little green men um, or little green people, um, then I think that a that we'd have to kind of pick up from fainting because I think that it would catch pretty much all of the current scientific experts out because they are absolutely confident that there's nothing beyond fossilized microorganisms but b if we did find life there i think we would back off immediately i think it would be an absolute no-go zone for us we would recognize the the um, opportunity for us to ruin their um, circumstances their ecosystem their environment would be so dramatic 
that we would I, I would imagine that there would be very clear instruction for us to just pull out completely. Um, and if if they were more advanced forms of life than just kind of algae or whatever, then I would imagine that we would spend a great deal of time and money putting remote monitoring in to keep an eye on what happens to them. So, yeah, that, that would be my best guess. But I mean, you know, talking to people that, you know, the, the, the chances of, of them finding um, uh, anything that like life that we would recognize um, is very, very low. I mean, you know, the, the, the hope is that there might be deep underground some still existing organisms, but, you know, they're going to be not more than sort of single cell type stuff. Okay, just a, a second point then. Did you see the photo released by NASA, I think, last week? Showing a door in the side of a hill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I also then looked at the ones that were shown in 1982 that showed a face on a rock um, and a pyramid. And then when they sent back more detailed um, uh, probes later on, they were discovered to just be kind of natural facilities. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've seen the image. Yeah. But, but I mean, that is, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, a civil engineer, so I, there's an arch at the top. You've got buttresses on the side with different courses of materials in it and there's a shadow on the side but that's a concrete kind of material inside lining it yeah i don't think that occurred geologically naturally no but well i mean bob i i you know let's let's hope that you're right and that i'm wrong but i would strongly suspect that when if they if they go and investigate that it, there will be a very mundane and somewhat disappointing um explanation for it and, and bob. perhaps I know I could go on about these things, and Steve probably thinks I've gone for hours about this kind of moon talk and stuff. But NASA, um, that they have a habit of publishing photos, and then they redact a lot of it. You see, the mm. just in front of the door, there's a smudgy white bit, and yeah. there's a few guys out there have got their YouTube sites who use Photoshop to actually go underneath the stuff. So. And actually, I've seen one or two sites. They've gone underneath that and their materials outside the doors, like it's actually the waste exit, you know, and they've just chucked mm. stuff out, if you, if you mm. see what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but mm. why does NASA do that? That, I don't know. I mean, that, that I mean, we're, you know, we're heading into the kind of, you know, mm. conspiracy theory area, which isn't one that I, I tend to, to, I mean, I'm just interested in the kind of, you know the the, the obvious um yeah. no, what's put in front of me but no so i'm not i'm not arguing with you at all i mean i'm you know this 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 they should be open and transparent and nasa do themselves no favors by being part of the air force or you know controlled by the that, that part of the, of the government that sees national security and does do a lot of redaction um and um confusion so you know they try to to and now we're getting to a stage where people are kind of well we don't believe you and that that i don't believe that that does any favors to what should be robust and completely transparent scientific endeavor so i mean you know there's a part of i mean i'm completely torn on this the, the rational part of me says there's an explanation for this because there always has been but the other part of me really really hopes that there will be some explanation that isn't necessarily um the one that nasa wants to use and does actually have a door with some stuff outside it i mean it'd be great if there was because i mean it would be that would really ignite a whole load of interest yeah okay thanks bob uh karen thank you hi hi andrew nice to see you nice to see you well again um I'm tempted to wade in on the philosophical and political arguments you've raised, but I won't. I will stick to the purely practical <clears throat> and say from all the conversations you've had with people. I mean, my hope was that what you were partly going to be talking about was what we might learn from exploring life off world um, that might help us to live more sustainably on this world. Because I know, obviously, these arguments have a lot of criticism from the environmental movement. That, and I have a degree of sympathy with well, we can't trash our own home and then just go somewhere else to trash that yeah but and you, you mentioned some of the things that have come out of space exploration in the past how much what proportion do you think of what we might find out from going on this journey could actually help us live more sustainably in other words without using more than we replace yep. on this world yeah, yeah well i mean okay so good point and now i do wish that the technology um on teams uh, would have allowed this because I've got so three, at least three of the examples um, 
the uh, research projects are ones where the primary focus is on um, sus environmental sustainability on this planet. So these are things that rather than thinking about technology that's going to be needed for off world living, it is actually technology that is designed for this planet to make us able to live a much, much either lower carbon or lower environmental um, impact presence. So one of them, for example, is using um, nanotechnology and nanochemistry to make um, a membrane that will be stuck to the interiors of either the space capsules or human habitation um, that actually um, absorbs um, atmospheric moisture and actually collects it into and filters it into potable water. So for areas that are, where, where people are living where there's extreme drought, um, which, you know, reading on reading today about Australia, there are plenty of places where actually the ability to extract um, wastewater or, or water and make it drinkable um, on an infinitely recyclable way using no energy. Uh, I mean, you know, and, th and this is using the combination. So this is this is basically nature inspired engineering. And what and the point to answer your question, Karen, is that. And I totally agree. I mean, I, you know, just so that we're clear on this, I, I'm I'm no, you know, I'm a, I'm agnostic. I'm I'm not stu I'm not advocating that we do off world living. I am simply saying that that it's being done by others and the, the, we should be getting involved in it. But as we are getting involved in it, um, the one thing that has jumped out of the page is that we cannot even start to begin to think about off world living without being without having a complete upturn on everything. So, for example, the, the whole kind of reduce, reuse, recycle is absolute because you're not going to get logistical resupply. So how you actually use the minimum amount of any resource that you're given to the maximum effect and then reuse it and then recycle it and then reuse it and recycle it as, as much as you possibly can is the starting point. And that is completely different from the approach that we've got at the moment, which is still, you know, we talk about a circular economy, but we are so far away from a circular economy yeah. at the moment. And yet, you, so you, you will have to start being fully circular to have off world living. And if you start from that premise, trust me, that ports over really easily to, to, to living here on Earth now. I mean, what it does do, and, and this is why I'm so interested by the kind of anthropological, psychological issues, is it fundamentally changes what it what we expect to be human and what it does do is it says materialism becomes something that's very much downplayed and it's much more about our sense of place and our sense of relationships because loneliness so so one of the and i'm sorry steve i'm going on a little bit about this no, no, but one of the on. one of the things that's cropped up is how important companionship has been during covid and we are going to be talking about people who are so completely isolated from anybody else that dealing with chronic loneliness is going to be something that you just have to factor in. So how do we actually get people to learn to be to cope with loneliness? Because and how do we get them to cope with having a very small circle of contacts and a very small repository relatively of of new information and certainly no spontaneous interaction um, for very long periods of time? I mean, it's really fascinating stuff. So there's, I think that there's plenty of opportunity for us to learn for, for the. And in fact, the whole reason why I've why the PA, so the, the, the plan for the for the Institute at the moment, because it's like, what are you going to, you know, you call something an Institute, what does it actually do? Well, my hope is that I'd like to create it as a as a base for PhD research. And every single PhD researcher that's got interested in off world living is is more motivated by saving this planet. Um, and what we've got on it and then saying actually the best way of us tackling the problems we've got here on earth is to imagine what it would be like if we were in apocalyptic earth situation well let's call that mars you know we've got no no resources we've got no air and if we want to survive in a situation like that and or avoid a situation like that then we have to create a better environment for us so i'm i'm actually really quite positive because i'm i'm and I'm, you know i'm old now but i'm really bowled over by the youngsters who want to come in and say this isn't an either or this is a both if we get this right there it will work for us brilliantly here and if and we'll only get it to work there if we make it work here first 
Okay. Th thank you. I mean, you certainly talked about the physical examples, practical and the behavioural. Um, maybe not a question to answer now, because I'm obviously I'll let um, Adrian come in with his question. But um, one would hope that where that research goes further, goes along, that we could also be starting to think about the political, because certainly those things you, you highlighted at the beginning about America making it so they can claim this. If we do find whatever form of life, the chances of us backing off, I think, are I don't share your optimism, shall we say? Um, I think we'll just want to claim it and destroy it, won't we? So hopefully some of those political uh, things can be thought about alongside some of this research. Anyway, thank you very much indeed. I'll uh, mute right. myself again now. Thanks, Karen. Right, Adrian, you'll go. Adrian, are you on mute or...? You can see your lips moving, but I'm not able to lip read. Ah, right. How's that? That's better. Yeah, gotcha. better. Is that better? Oh, okay, great. Uh, right. Not sure whether this is much a question or an observation. Uh, it seems to me that to try and tackle this staggering complexity uh, that we need to for this off world living, it's not so much thinking out of the box as out of the planet completely. Mm. Um, and, you know, and I'm wondering. Uh, really two observations, both related, I think. One is whether there are lessons to be taken from a mass and uh, probably nearly a century of science, science fiction. Um, certainly, I think, uh, never mind perhaps the technical, but certainly a lot of the political, psychological, uh, social uh, aspects from, uh, uh, you know, have, have been um, uh, uh, discussed in various science fiction novels. Mm. But there's one I'd like to sort of just just pick up on. A Van Vogt in, in in the novel Voyage of the Space Beagle, 1950, proposed um, uh, a scientific. It wasn't. It was the anti-specialism, the Nexialist, who's uh, someone who can see connections between mm. different disciplines. Mm. And I'm wondering whether this is the ultimate challenge for an exilist and you need to be looking for someone or people like this for your institute. Yeah. Because whilst you're right that you, what you said about uh, energized young people who are doing exciting PhDs, those are unbelievably specialized. What you need to have is people who can go looking outside the box, outside the planet and say, ah, hang on, this from that discipline, this from that discipline, we can combine these ideas, combine these technologies. Is is that something that, that you'd thought about? Oh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I hadn't put it as eloquently as that, but but so two, two points to make. One is that, and I'm really, really annoyed that the technology, because the presentation that you didn't see was actually one that I did for the British Interplanetary Society. Now, I'd frankly didn't even know that there was such a thing but for any of you interested it's on the south side of Vauxhall Bridge um, it's been there it's the oldest interplanetary society in the world it's driven by this really wonderful combination and Adrian I'm speaking exactly to your point which is that science fiction authors have been on the money quite a lot of the time and they tend to see things ahead and then sort of engineering, maths and technology catch up. Not in every case um, and obviously not at the speed that science, science fiction writers can, can, can crank out because they can see, you know, infinitely into the future and, and in sort of multiverses and all that good stuff. But in the areas, Asimov, or all the other kind of great names, you know, the, of the great age, actually they, they, they sponsored um, a lot of research. That then went on to become the, the the arguments that became the science. So the first thing is that I do not belittle it at all. Uh, I mean, it might be a lot, you know, sneered at uh, genre, but I think that you know there is. I mean, obviously, there's a load of guff in science fiction, but there's a load of guff in everything, every area. But some of the really smart stuff. Um, it, and then you go on to talk about one example. And and it's, I mean, I'm, I'm Steve knows me well enough. I'm I I really don't believe that I I, I want to declare an ego so I'm not I'm not going to use the but so what I am going to say is that the reason for creating this institute is because the thing that I've taken so much joy out of is being the person who holds a flag up and says 
I'm interested in this. And then people come to me saying, well, I've been working on this, which I think relates to it. And they meet each other through someone like me. Now, I'm not I've not the great I've not got the great mind to see with malice aforethought, as it were, to go, well, you definitely need to speak to you. But if I can provide a forum where that can actually happen and, you know, people present their deep siloed piece of research and then it latches on to somebody who went, I have absolutely no idea where you come from or what you do, but I, it, what you've just said resonates and we should work together. And, you know, where, where, where I've really, where I'm seeing that happen, and, uh, and again, it's only a, a sort of small scale, but I'm now seeing people that are bridging from science to engineering or from engineering to architecture or from architecture to art. And these are people that, are, that and, and, you know, the, the proof of this isn't just some sort of waffly answer. It's actually the fact that the PhD has got supervisors in two completely different faculties or in very, very different departments. And these in PhDs are acting as themselves little bridges. So I sort of see this like, you know, bridge on bridge on bridge. Um, that connects up. And, and you're absolutely right. At the end of the day, I mean, when we started talking about this, we were saying about, oh, you know, uh, and it, you know, as others have used it before me, but it was that it was that, oh, you know, what you don't need here is blue sky thinking. We need black sky thinking. And that's absolutely the case. You do need people to think the unthinkable and do the do, do you know, it's where whether you love him, hate him or don't care about him. But Elon Musk has simply turned around and says, we're going to do this. And he just cracks on and does it. And he has so far, you know, the things that he said he's going to do, he's pretty much delivered on. He's not said, you know, I'm going to develop teleportation because that don't, nobody thinks that can be done. But if he says that he's going to develop a reusable spacecraft um, and put, you know, 40,000 satellites into space to create a, a universal Internet accessible from everywhere, then he just cracks on and does it. So, you know, I, I have hope that there'll be people like him. To go to Karen's point about the politics, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, the one thing that that scared me about, I mean, there's obviously a no, load of horror stories, but um, I don't know if you picked up on it, but the, um, uh, the when Russia invaded Ukraine and America took out sanctions against Russia, Russia threatened not to bring back one of the American astronauts who was at end of term on the International Space Station because currently the um, the the main way of getting to and from the space station is via um, Russian rockets and the, and the and the Russian head of the space agency said we're not going to bring the, the American back which kind of that does worry me because the one thing that you can say safely say about space is that it's massively collaborative and there are international there are very few international borders you know this is kind of all for one um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, you, you won't get to Mars um, without huge amounts of cooperation and collaboration. So I actually see it as a positive <clears throat> for political steering rather than factionism. But that is genuinely a hope. I mean, I can't say for sure that that will happen. OK, thank thanks, you. Adrian. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, and finally, I think for today, Alan Glasgow. Alan. Hi. So, so I, I, I must apologise. I missed the very early part of your your, your, your your presentation. But one of the things that interests me, if it's going to take us 80 years or 100 years to, uh, to 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 get to Mars, and yes, it's going to be a big, big, big project. Um, we're going to need. We don't want groupthink in there, but we're going to need quite a lot of people who are lifers in that type of project to gain the experience and to be able to pass it on and, and and i just i just wonder if 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 in 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 the world today um we, we almost have an environment where people want to jump from project to project to to a, and 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 we don't create sufficient domain knowledge mm -hmm. in in the you know you don't want groupthink. You don't want everybody to be an expert in spaceflight in that project. But you're going to. How are you going to? Does the institute start to consider how we address that that sort of challenge? And 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 is it viewed as something which is important to create that domain knowledge in you know transport to the stars as it as it as it, as it, as it or the planets anyway. I mean, I, yeah, it's a very, very good point. And I think that one of the things I mean, I, I don't know, I don't think there's anybody um, from the space industry 
on the call, but I, I've not been to, but I, I know that um, in in Brus in Belgium, the um, International Space University exists, and they discuss exactly this. So they what 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 they're looking for is to become these kind of domain knowledge um, custodians, so yes. that the we we remove the risk of an individual being a lifer. It's a, it doesn't really matter how long you're in there for, and to a certain extent, often they don't want somebody to be in there because if you're going to have one solution to a problem, you're always going to have that one solution, and you know you you you, you never solve the problem or you only solve the problem one way. Um, and so the the argument about and this is one of the I mean this is a conversation for for another time, but the way that the space projects missions are let with a prime contractor and massive amounts of uh, of proof of concept and you know having to ad address getting you know low level low level trls up to higher levels and all that good stuff it it, it naturally leads to this in it's a massively fluid and, and i think absolutely wonderful situation now where you've got national agencies who are funded by national governments, so, so the UK Space Agency, with domain knowledge here, that recognises that it's going to need to work with experts that sit either in academia or in the private sector. And what it does is it shuffles that around in a way that you just don't see. I've never, I don't see it in, I mean, maybe it happens in, in areas that I'm just not exposed to, but this but the argument is that the, the, the UK Space Agency or ESA or NASA or whatever, certainly the Western ones, recognise that they haven't got the answers to themselves. And on occasion, they need to go out to the, but they've got some of the answers. But that, so it's a, it's a triangle between government agency and deep knowledge that's held there, some of it national security, private sector who gets to, to, to do it and make a profit, and academe that's often sitting in the background going, well, where's the base knowledge going to come from? The, the, so we, we produce the smart kids, um, and then, and then, you know, some of the some of them will stay in the university and inculcate that environment that you're talking about. What we need is the stability, and this is the point about the 80 to 100 years. And this is the reason why I'm so excited about this institute. Is it gives us, you know, the great thing is that do you trust the private? Well, can you trust the private sector to exist and have that main, maintain that interest? The answer is no. Can you ask government? Well, depends on the politics. If the politics goes against, then the agency gets no money, everybody loses their job, blah blah blah. But universities can often be a very good place to actually act as that repository. Yeah. Um, but we only act if there's if there's interest. Otherwise, we die just like anybody else. Yes. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic, and I do think that your point is well made. That the the this is this is an area where you could to, and and this is why we're starting to see. I mean, UCL, you know, I'm banging the drum for UCL, but other universities are doing the same. We're actually starting to see space professionals come out. These are people who study space politics, space economics, space technology. They're not they're no longer the real it is. You know, we talk about the rocket scientists. We t we still talk about it. I know it's not rocket science. I mean, Steve said it earlier on this call today. Well, actually, what you're getting to are true space professionals who understand actually quite a lot of this and go, well, that's all very well. But where are you going to get the money from for it? Because it's a great technical idea, but no one's going to fund it. And that means that the idea stops immediately rather than it going off and getting nowhere. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're very welcome. And Steve, I apologise. I'll, I'll have to investigate whether it's your teams that I'm on or something. Well, we could. Uh, I can try I, and share. I can put the. <laughs> I, I mean, I, because it's such a big presentation, you won't be able to email it out. So I don't know whether well, you want me to record it and I can put it on a YouTube or something. Let's have a chat. Um, maybe just after this, if you've got a couple of minutes, and yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I've got a couple of suggestions on how we can do this. Um, much food, much food for thought in all of this, Andrew. Um, despite what your initial reservations might be, because um, it does give rise to to so much new ways of manipulating thought. I think you know, because uh, you, you said you know, trying to find, uh, and Adrian touched on it too. I mean, does it not sort of strike you that we need to maybe go back to the Middle Ages or the Renaissance and and, and have that you know the approach to to, to learning um, that certainly many of the greats of the Renaissance did, which was that there were as much composers as they were architects and, yeah, yeah. and painters. 
and it's that multidisciplinary approach. And, and I suppose the 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 by all means um, promote the universities as possibly the the federation of of, of of learning that can carry these ideas forward. But there's also potentially maybe they would perceive that as a threat because they have, they have to change their structures maybe somehow you know because and again it wouldn't be redesigning education and thought just for space uh living uh, uh in a sense it would it should apply to the the whole world and again rocketing into my head no pun intended is this system this approach you know this systems approach to to uh to life um not just in terms of learning or, or design but to, you know this 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 holistic approach within which we can see shapes coming and allow for, for, for stuff to come in from anywhere really to, mm. to, to inform thought and then grappling with how you actually convert that into you know things that get um, explored and, and possibly turned into ideas but I, I i like the thought going to the analogy of, of some of the best innovations come out of some of the worst circumstances so you know wartime develops mm. so much and, and again this idea of being able to, and also to perpetuate over 80 years, this idea of being able to to use much of the uh, climate crisis as the opportunity to pilot and, and, and test um, the ideas of how we're going to have to come to uh, terms with living on this planet, let alone um, uh, elsewhere. And, I, and, and thinking about, in particular, Australia, where so, somebody told me, you know, that Australia is is, is heading for disaster. Climate in both senses, you know, floods and drought, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and would, would provide an enormously good test bed for something that could be seen to be for the overall benefit of us all. Yeah. And so, I'm, I, again, thinking it's, it's not beyond the wit of, of the many to come up with, you know, the perfect pitch to 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 to, um, to not only do that development, but to see how that 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 coincides with getting people um, or, or explore or using that model of life on Mars to, 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 to maybe come out with some of the ideas that we need to to use at, at the same time and place on, on planet Earth as well. Um, so uh, 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 on, on that basis, I'm kind of thinking I'd like to, uh, we're going to sort your, your presentation out. I, I, I've, I'm in half a mind to say, let's try and continue this conversation to a larger audience and maybe um, uh, if you're around um, in a few weeks time, six or seven weeks time, which might be sort of early July to pick up on this. Um, I'd also like to, 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 to explore with, with Karen's permission, the ethicality of all this, because I kind of agree with her too, that, that I think if we found something massively precious that needed to be shifted back and there were these little green men there, what would we do that we didn't do to some of the places through exploration we you know, we we did when we found certain minerals and spices and foodstuffs in, in in other places of the earth. You know, you said we were explorers. Well, unfortunately, the explorers were were, were, were driven by the money men mm. uh, to a large extent, and they, they they just destroyed everything in order to get to those materials, didn't they? Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And I I I I I wonder what kind of legislation could stop us from doing that again. Given, in a sense, and here's another point of discussion: the 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 in inverted commas muted success of the united nations as an international body for representation mm. what what sort of governance would really work there but but again ought to be readily applicable here i could go on forever but i won't um i but yeah uh, great session andrew i thought really you know well, thank so, you i'm sorry i'm sorry that, that the like, technology wasn't no, well so am i sorry. i mean it's a bloody disaster today but uh we, we we we've got um i think some very very good conversation We'll try and figure out um, just after this call how we can get the um, uh, the presentation shared to, to to people. But I think yeah, looking ahead so to to maybe early July if we come come back onto this topic anyway, because I I think it just it, it bleeds into you know your continued interest, but also I hope to to some of the people that we're on the receiving end of yeah. the session. Yeah. And above all, this 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 responsible and ethical and conscientious approach to to um, to, to projects that we're going to get. So. I shall conclude there with a big thank you to you, Andrew. So thanks again for that. And very briefly move on to uh, to talk about next week. And um, uh, again, under the aegis of, of Karen, um, she's going to be talking about, and, and maybe with a colleague or two, um, this revision or this the, the, these new competences or this new competence framework that has been developed 
uh, within, uh, well, is it within the PMI or is it uh, another a body or an organisation? But it seems to chime oh, well. and be consonant with everything that you're doing anyway. <laughs> well, I am on the PMI curriculum review, but this is, I'm specifically talking about the work I've done yeah. on the competences. If you want to call it um, PM competences decoded, because I think yeah. if you ca count everything that's been identified, people have come up with like 81 different competences. So yeah. I'll talk talk about how we're through that for responsibility okay but this lines up uh, under this notion of responsible and and, and uh, sustainable and, and uh, conscientious dare i say yeah yeah okay mm -hmm. so um yeah project management with a conscience that would be um that would be good um okay so i look forward to seeing uh uh, uh to, to talking about that because again i think it leads on to some of the issues that came out today um and i'll uh again um say goodbye to everybody so thanks again to andrew looking forward to karen and see you next thursday hopefully without quite so much um multiverse applied as we did today so uh, uh stay safe and yeah. uh see you next thursday goodbye <laughs> thanks everybody <laughs>